everyone, and welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation, as usual, as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Here we go. Don't you think about it? You will bring about the mental change. We will. Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to Alzheimer Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and once again, we have a great show for you today. We are going to be talking with Thanacare, which uh, is all about advanced care planning. And we're going to be talking about a registry that everyone can use. But before we talk with our guest, Dr. Michael Madison, I'm going to give a couple of shout outs. One is to Twiddles. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Twiddle, but they have great, great sensory aids for people living with dementia that bring comfort back and can really help with sundowning. They also have a product called Adapt a Wrap, which can take a lot of the frustration out of getting dressed because you're not having to pull anything down over the head. And then Lorenzo's house is having their Youth Summit, um, June 14th and 15th. That's free. I would encourage people to go to Lorenzo's uh, house.org for information there. And then there are a couple of support groups that I welcome people to join. One is called Caregiver Connect. We do that at the Shoreview Community Center here in Minnesota from 10 to 1130 on the last Wednesday of each month, and that is at the community center there. Also, I do a memory cafe, which is virtual, the second and fourth Wednesday of the month from about 1 to 2.30, 3 o'clock. That is central time, but we have people all over the world that participate. And of course, I would urge you to check out alzheimerspeaks.com. We have tons of free resources. You can also find our book, Betty the Bald Chicken, Lessons in How to Care. And you can also access Dementia Map, which has over 150 categories that you can search, a glossary of terms, a blog, and a calendar of events. So those are just a couple of things to think about. Let's talk to Dr. Michael Madison. Well, Dr. Madison, I am so excited to have you on the show. I think this is a really important topic uh, that we are going to be discussing today. But before we start, if you don't mind introducing yourself to our audience. Well, thank you, Lori. Uh, my name is Dr. Michael Madison. I am an interventional neuroradiologist, and I have practiced uh, for more than 25 years in the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul. In my career, I an interventional neuroradiologist is somebody, I spend my time primarily treating, treating patients who have strokes or, uh, or brain aneurysms is, is my specific focus. And it was, uh, it was in my, uh, primarily in treating my stroke patients that, uh, that, that I tended to uh, identify some of the problems that we currently have with our advanced care planning um, in this country and our preparation for making decisions at end of life. Yeah, they are vast and many, that's for sure, because it's such a spooky conversation to most people. And, you know, I've always approached it as, you want control in your life today, why don't you want it in your life tomorrow? <laughs> you know, but, but people are so afraid of getting ill or having someone else be in control or dying that they just avoid those. And it's um, it's just a very, very important topic um, to be clear on uh, kind of your, your last hurrah in, in many ways. And uh, it, it thinks, I don't think people understand how much things can be misinterpreted until you're in the thick of things. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a real problem. And uh, you know, I think the encouraging thing has been that uh, there are, a lot, a lot of good people like yourself who are, are we're working to try to change it. Um, but it is, it is what you said is true. And that is that 
you know, the decisions that you would make for your end of life experience, were you to actually make them, are far different than what typically happens if you don't make them. And, uh, and so, you know, classic example for me was, uh, you know, I get it, an 88 year old female, uh, who has dementia. Um, uh, she's in a memory care unit. Um, she is no longer able to make decisions for herself or for her, you know, with regard to her health care. And she presents to me with uh, a, a large vessel stroke. Uh, and so under those circumstances, what I do is that there's a clot generally at the base of the brain in one of the main vessels, and I go up and try to suck the clot out of there and open up that vessel, which is a very effective procedure. But, you know, it doesn't do anything other than to return the patient to that whatever baseline, at best, that the whatever baseline that they had prior to the procedure. And and so despite the fact that the patient's 88, despite the fact that she's in a memory cure unit, you know, all too often, no conversations have taken place about what she would or wouldn't have wanted. And, um, and the, unfortunately, in the absence of those conversations, the patient's family feels some often guilt or responsibility for saying no more care for mom or grandma, you know, and then, and, and that leads them then to just say, do it, do the procedure. Even though I've said to them very clearly, well, you know, best case scenario, uh, your mom or your grandma is, you know, she's going to get better from the stroke, but go back to the memory care unit and, and die of dementia, which is, you know, of the various ways you can die, dementia, be, you know, because of what it does to take away your, you know, who you are and your personality uh, before your body leaves um, is, you know, a very, often a very difficult and tragic death for not only the patient, but their family. And so, you know, what ends up happening is they say yes to the procedure because they haven't prepared. And, and then as a result, they, you know, I've had many, many patients, families call me back, you know, six or eight months later and say, I wish we would have maybe listened to you and, and, you know, and taken the opportunity of that stroke to short circuit some of the pain and suffering that we're currently experiencing. And so, you know, what, what we hope to accomplish is just to get people to think about it and plan for their death ahead of time. And, you know, specifically answering questions about who's going to make decisions for you if you can't make decisions for yourself. Um, and, you know, the, the, that is one of the bigger decisions to be made. And, you know, and I think that most of us, you know, if we, if, if, if you're, you know, if you if you can make decisions for yourself, that that is your responsibility. You get to do that, and you know you might make good decisions, or you might not make good decisions, but you, there's still your decisions to make. It's just that some of the problems I feel like that really occur are when you're no longer able to make those decisions, and you haven't defined who is supposed to make those decisions, and you haven't helped your family generally understand what you would have wanted to to have done, and then as a result things get a lot messier and we end up tending to medicalize death and a lot of unnecessary procedures get done that don't meaningfully impact the the length of the remaining life or the quality of the remaining life. And then by definition, those two procedures are, are, are questionable in terms of whether or not they should be done or, or not done. And so we're hoping to get people to think about death and plan for death, at least to the point where, we can avoid some of the dysfunction that we currently see, which is nearly ubiquitous as so few people do it currently. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I'm going to pause back for just a second because I always like to ask all of my guests if they've been personally touched by dementia in their own family or friends, and then we'll hop back into the topic itself. Yes, uh, uh, I have had a family member, a close family member, uh, uh, my brother actually with dementia um, and um, my wife's um, m my wife's mother's sister also had dementia. So we've had some experience with dementia patients uh, 
personal experience with dementia patients, and I've seen some of the 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 heart the difficulties obviously and the hardships that are incurred by both the obviously the patients and then also their family members uh, as if it's a it's it's a dip, if it's a, it's a very difficult disease um, I and then I I have a very um, extensive experience in my practice as well with my patients and so yeah I I mean if I'm being honest I I look at dementia as one of the worst ways to go. I mean, I mean, I mean, it, it's a you know, death is a certainty. We're all gonna die, and you know, I, I, I would hope for, I would hope not to have any more, you know, either myself or my family members, any more of my family members, you know, have a personal experience with dementia. Obviously, can't control that, but I, I wouldn't want that for my family members if I could avoid it. Yeah, yeah, just like we would want cancer and and different things. Yeah. I do think the industry is starting to change in terms of how they care for somebody with dementia, which makes quality of life a better issue. And, um, you know, my mom lived with dementia for 30 years. So been there, done that at all different levels. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because we, we had a show one time and people asked me, well, Lori, you know, what would you want? Would you, would you want to have ended your, your mom's life earlier um, if you had the opportunity, you know, like if she got sick or, you know, one of those types of things and, and instead of extending life, just letting the body take its natural course uh, versus fixing it just to carry on in, in the dementia world. And my answer, I think, surprised a lot of people. And we had, we had a lot of different people in this conversation. And I said, you know, I wouldn't have given up a, a moment of my mom's time because, um, or her life, because she taught me so much during those 30 years. She really <laughs> enriched my life, which isn't everyone's experience, needless to say. But I also said for myself, I want that choice. I want people to know what it is I want, because I, I don't really want to live for 30 years with that disease, you know, in and of itself. And so, um, you know, I think it's just an important conversation to to be had. One of the things, let's dive into, you know, um, Thanic Air and, and what is it and how, how did it get born? What is this company all about? The, the, the mission statement is to try to encourage our patients who are our primary customers to plan for uh, what they would want as part of their end of life experience. Um, and again, nothing is fixed in stone. Um, it's all you can always change your mind, but just going through the process of defining who is going to be your healthcare surrogate, probably first and foremost, who is going to make the decisions for you in the event that you can't, um, uh, and then trying to help th- those individuals who are making those decisions to understand what you would want or not want as part of your end of life experience. Uh, and that, that can be tremendously beneficial. I think that, uh, you know, our loved ones are always going to try to, they're the ones that are generally going to be assigned the task. It's either going to be a husband or a wife or a son or a daughter typically. Uh, but, it, their task is made easier if you help them by defining what you want or don't want in the event that you can't make those decisions. And I think specifically, it's very helpful to them to uh, not feel guilty, you know, if they're if they're if they're just simply following through on what you want, it's a lot easier for them to potentially say, you know what, this doesn't make sense. You know, we're not going to do any more. And uh, again, they may not follow your wishes, but they, but if they, you know, my experience has been that if you make those wishes clear and we do videotape those wishes, once you've completed all the documents, we kind of videotape them. And the videotape is simply just a, a, a typically a, a one or two minute video of the patient expressing that what they've defined here is what they want. 
you know, and they're thankful for the life that they've had typically, but they please, these are my wishes. These are what, this is what I would like to do in the event that I can't make decisions for myself. And, and what would I, what I've seen when this happens correctly is that the, the, the very positive things that happen or potentially can happen when this is done ahead of time are multiple. Um, one, patients, most of us want to die outside of a hospital. Um, you know, we, we would like to die at home, surrounded by our friends and family. That's the, the majority of people feel that way. Right now, a majority of patients don't die that way. And so, you know, you, the opportunity to die in a setting that you want um, is, is created by planning ahead. Um, having uh, the whole end of life process, which is generally going to be can't, you know, it's inherently traumatic for a family to lose a loved one, but it's less traumatic if you plan ahead. Uh, and so what I see repeatedly is if they don't make plans, that too often it's not clear who's supposed to make the decisions. And, and the family, there, there is true, real family dysfunction, which occurs as a result of, of, of all of this. And I mean, the tragic thing is that you know, so many of us, we work our entire lives to uh, <clears throat> to develop and nurture our families. You know, and the last thing that we would want to see is that our end of our end of life experience contributes to dysfunction or even fracture of the family unit. And, and I've come across many, many situations where brothers and sisters no longer talk to each other because of fighting over what should have happened at, at end of life. And, and I think that, that, that those are real tra tragic situations. Right? And I think that, uh, I think the final point I would make is that the, and this is becoming more and more apparent and it's a, it's a secondary concern, but it's not an insignificant secondary concern. And that is the, that sometimes the, you know, the financial costs associated with all this care at end of life, you know, tend to really negatively impact families as well. Uh, and, and, you know, people work their whole lives to, to you know, to develop a, a nest egg of sorts, you know, that, that they, you know, they they, they live their whole life believing that that nest egg would really at the time of their death, go to their spouse or their kids. And, you know, sometimes what ends up happening altogether from my perspective too often, the nest egg is kind of eaten away by long-term care costs, and you know, and that that you know that you know to to maintain a life and a quality of life that that individual in their prime would never have wanted, you know. Um, and so there are very many reasons why doing this and moving away from denial that you know that we're going to die um, is a, a much more effective thing. Uh, for the for the patient, for their family, um, uh, it's a uh, it's it it is simply the right thing to do, and uh, I'm hoping that our efforts, along with the efforts of many other caring people like yourself, you know, we can get we can break through this divide that currently exists where people are refusing to do this and and move forward in a much more positive way. Well, and I think it was really important when you talked about, we always talk about dysfunction of family, but that fracture of family, it happens much more often than, than people know, because it's not something that's, that's talked about a lot, but it just kind of disintegrates or builds this wall. And, you know, because people go, well, no, they never told me that. Well, they did tell me that, but you know, if someone else isn't comfortable with that, and I, I use the example of like, I want to be cremated. And my daughter, you know, I have one daughter and she goes, well, I don't want to cremate you. I don't care what you want. This is my life. I want to be cremated, but I don't, I don't want, I don't want you burnt. I, I, I got that just bothers me, mom, that visualization. And so I kind of joked with her and I said, honey, for once in my life, I can be small. Let me be small. Let me, let me blow in the wind. I don't want you to feel like the only place you can connect with me is in a grave. I want you to have access to me all the time. And this is a way I think that will help you do that. You know, you can, you can 
put me in a container. You can, you know, sprinkle me up at the lake. You can do a zillion different things. You can crush me and, and make me into jewelry, What whatever, you know, whatever works for you. But this is still my life and this is what I want. And if we wouldn't have had that conversation multiple times, I, you know, I know I would not be cremated. I know today I will be though, because we had that. And so I'm more comfortable and she really understands what it is that I want. We've also had the conversation um, many times I brought up to her that if I get cancer, I don't, I really honestly don't think I'll do treatment. I've seen too many people really suffer and that's to me, not quality of life. And again, if I get a diagnosis, I, I know I will evaluate it and maybe I'll change my mind, but I really don't think so. You know, I've lived a good life. I don't think we're here to live forever. Um, and I don't want to be a burden and I don't want people to feel sad. And I know death is sad, but at least it's, it's a process that you can move through versus just watching somebody being really sick. And I know some of my audience is not going to agree with that. And that's okay. You know, but you tell your story and what you want and let people know, because we should have the right over our own bodies um, in terms of what we're comfortable with. And so often, you know, somebody can get in an accident, like you said, have an aneurysm or a stroke, and those conversations haven't been had. We just had a friend um, pass away from a stroke or not a stroke, but an aneurysm, you know, and had three surgeries and multiple little procedures. And, you know, family was told, you know, she's basically brain dead, but it was really a difficult thing to unplug her and to let her be free. And yet she had told some friends, but not family, what her wishes were. But it, to see the family struggle with all that, it's, it's painful for everybody. I think involved and, um, and I just, I don't know, I guess I grew up in a family where my mom always brought us to funerals and wakes. She got scolded, you know, I'm 63 or, or 64. And so, you know, times have changed, but back then she actually got scolded, you know, bringing us children um, through this death and dying process. And she was very adamant why is it okay for them to be involved in, you know, when a baby is born, but not when someone exits, you know, this realm? And she was just a really, really big advocate of that. And I guess I've picked up on that, that it's okay to have these conversations. It's okay to have these feelings, but let's just make things as smooth and as comfortable for everyone involved in honor wishes. And I don't know. That's just how my mind works. But I know when people are scared of the conversation, they just run, you know, or plug their ears. They don't want to hear it. They don't. This isn't going to happen to us. Well, it's going to happen to all of us sooner or later. You know, there's there's no way out that you're that you're not going to leave this world basically at this point. So uh, it is an important conversation. That's why I was so excited to have you on the show today, because I just don't think um, we're in that space yet of people feeling comfortable enough. And I, and I love that your company is creating an environment where it's safe to talk about and safe to share, even adding in those videos saying, yeah, I, I did review this. I did give it thought. These are my wishes. You don't have to second guess me. I'm okay with this. You know, that just gives family a, a huge relief, I, I, I think. Well, if you're just tuning in right now, we have been talking with Dr. Madison, who is the co-founder and president and CEO of Vanacare, which is all about advanced care planning. And it's been a really interesting conversation. We're going to take a little break and hear about QBlocks, which is a webmaster who is absolutely fabulous. And then we will be right back with Dr. Madison to learn more about advanced care planning. I also want to introduce you all to QBlocks. They have been absolutely excellent to deal with. They have been in business for 18 years and they serve the globe. I can't say enough good things about this company. I've had a lot of bad experiences. I don't know about you with tech companies. They have made a very complicated process very easy and their staff is so kind, so polite, so respectful to work with. And 
you know, when I am frustrated and ready to pull my hair out, they just smile and tell me everything's going to be okay. And they really are just on top of the communication, which alleviates so much stress as an owner when you're dealing with tech issues. You can get a 10% discount. Visit them at QBlocks at C U E B L O C K S dot com. Or you can email them at let's talk at qblocks.com. For that 10% discount, just put Lori, L O R I, in the inquiry form. And again, I don't think you'll be disappointed. I surely haven't been. I, I can't rave enough about this company. And that's kind of rare these days. Yeah, it gives them permission, you know, and, and it reinforces, like you said, that the, you know, it's, it's sometimes easy for them to ignore a paper document, you know, um, especially if there's tension or whatever, but the, the, you know, we don't have to play the video all the time, but the the video is often helpful to kind of ground or reground people to the, no, this is their, these are their wishes. They've defined this, they've thought about it. And you, you're correct about, you know, the, the last thing we do on this earth is to die, you know, and, it, it is, and it's our death. It's not somebody else's. And you know, and we should be, we should be more, um, take more ownership over it rather than to leave it to somebody else. So to to decide how that that's going to take place. And like you said, I mean, most people at this point in time, it's not universal, but a lot of people do want to be cremated. You know, and they and they and once people feel you know, once they've made a decision as to how they want their burial to take place, either in a casket or by cremation, they're generally pretty adamant that that's what they want to have happen, you know, and, and I believe that they should be equally adamant about and willing to have the conversations about what that end of life process looks for them prior to that death, so that, that they can help their loved ones and ensure that what they would like to see happen actually happens. And so the, the, the conversations are difficult, but they're not at all impossible. You know, I mean, in the, in the framework of the advanced care planning process through Thanacare, kind of, we just walk through all the different conversations and we, you know, uh, you know, we, we walk through them with our patients, Um, our customers who use our software walk through them with their patients and, it really has been shown in our experience to date to be a very positive one for both the patient and their family. You know, so patient gets to actually express their wishes while they're still cognizant enough to do so. And, and the family gets to understand what those wishes are. The, the family gets to understand, well, okay, if mom's not here, dad's going to make the decisions and maybe one of the children you know, and, and so that there isn't friction over about who's making the decisions and they have a guideline of what those decisions should be. And so the positive thing is that people, it, it, the, this, the dysfunction that we see now is pretty easily rectifiable, you know, and people can die a much more peaceful, graceful death outside of the hospital, which, you know, again, we don't get to choose our death. So I think if we were, most of us would probably live to be 95, healthy up to their, our 95th, you know, until the day we die, and then we would die in our sleep, you know. But but unfortunately, as you alluded to with the cancer conversation, and 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 obviously with the dementia conversation, it doesn't have to be that way. It can, you know, it, you know, death can be a lot more challenging experience than dying in your sleep. Um, and I think what we and you also alluded to the quality of life conversation, which is a key piece of this. And that is, you know, we always think about lifespan, and but we really need to think about health span. Because once your health goes to the point where you're no longer able to make decisions, usually the quality of life is compromised. I mean, it may not be so compromised that it's not worth living, but it's definitely compromised enough that, there should be conversation about what you would or wouldn't want under those circumstances. And in, and unfortunately in the absence of those conversations, typically we end up doing a lot of 
um, additional medical interventions to try to prolong that life, which in my experience, that patient in all likelihood in their prime would never have wanted. Yeah. Well, and you think of the car accidents and in all the different ways that we can go and just, you know, do you want to be resuscitated? Do you know, what kind of means do you want people to to intervene on. I found on Compassion and Caring, they have a wonderful advanced directive and it was specific to dementia. I don't know if it is so much anymore and I never thought it should be, but they layered it and said, because in so many times we think black and white, well, if this happens, I want this. But what if this happens and this happens at the same time or this and this and this all happen, that's going to impact your quality of life. And they they bring those scenarios up for you to review and to be able to change level of care. And I think it makes it so much easier to, d- to make those decisions because, you know, when you haven't thought about this conversation, you haven't thought about the conversation. So you don't know of all the different variables that can come up. And so they really do a nice job. And again, it could be much longer and much more in depth, but then no one's going to do it but it really gives you a good idea. Like if I can't speak, if I can't get out of bed, if I can't, I mean, there's, there's so many different levels to it of when do you want, you know, that advanced care, you know, or procedures, I should say, to stop, to try to intervene from you, from you passing on, or do you want to just focus on care and comfort? You know, um, I remember my dad, I'll use him as an example. He had a brain tumor and one, he, they gave him a year and a half to live. He lived four and a half. We were blessed, but like two months before he died, he, instead of taking an elevator, he fell down two flights of steps and he was never, ever going to be able to live independently again. And so he landed in a nursing home and then he got pneumonia and he was on hospice during this time. And, you know, they asked, do you want to give him the pneumonia shot? And, you know, my mom with dementia said, yes, my two brothers said yes. And I said, no. And they all looked at me like I was crazy. And I said, this is not going to make dad better. He's not going to be able to get up and walk and talk. This is going to get rid of his lung issue. That is it. And then I looked at the hospice person and I said, please, if I am wrong, correct me. But that is my understanding. And I just don't think that's how dad would want to continue to live. And she said, no, you're exactly right. You know, just like what you were referring to before, it'll fix this, but it doesn't fix that. And everyone then agreed, you know, they, they, they looked at it different, you know, because it's always kind of that immediate choice of yes or no, yes or no. And it's not as easy as yes or no. Um, No. There's a, there's a lot of middle ground um, that you have to think of. And, and it was interesting because my dad held on and, you know, we knew he was going to probably die from the pneumonia, but he held on like four more days until my brother accepted it. He said he accepted the, our decision as a family, but he was still struggling with it. And I knew the night he decided, we walked out to the parking lot and he was going to leave and I was going to stay with dad. And he said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay with you. And I knew he had accepted it. And by the time we walked back up, my dad was letting go. And so he was there to see my dad. Pat. But I think dad was holding on for Scott to come to that conclusion that this, this is what I want, son. This is what I want. This was the right decision. And you, you know, I think you did make the right decision. You know, I think that and it would have been made, it would have been a little bit easier perhaps if, if some of those conversations, you know, had been memorialized before your dad got to that place. I mean, you, you know, again, it, that's my experience. And I think it might've been easier on your family if they would have, if you would have been, defined as the medical surrogate along with your mom, you know, to, so that, you know, that that's the kind of thing that I think can make it even smoother so that you don't feel maybe as alone and, you know, at, at least initially in making the right decision. And, and there isn't that potential for family conflict, you know, you can diminish that family conflict potential. I think that, you know, my experience is that again, we going back to the initial problem, 
none of us want to die. So then we all think it's okay to live in denial, you know, and especially in this country. I don't think it's necessarily like that in every other country, but in, in this country, we all, you know, we all kind of sail along and feel it's okay not to think about it. The The other truth is that none of us, none of my patients, they always, it's the same. Well, if you can get me, you know, if, if we're con- talking about a medical intervention, they'll say, well, if you can make, give me back my life, then the answer is yes. But if I'm going to end up in a nursing home, I don't want to end up in a nursing home. And, you know, and I think, you know, the, and despite the fact that nearly nobody wants to end up in a true quote unquote nursing home, none of us take the steps to avoid that endpoint. You know, and, and and so again, far far too many of us end up in the nursing home, living that life that we wouldn't necessarily have wanted, and we certainly wouldn't necessarily have wanted prolonged. Mm-hmm. And you know, and so I think that there was a time, you know, not that many years ago, where you know, back in you know, I mean in the farm day, you know, quote, unquote, our farm days, you know, where, you know, pneumonia was a very common endpoint, mm-hmm. you know, and, and it wasn't necessarily, it was kind of a peaceful one. It was, you know, it was quiet. It wasn't painful a few days and people were transitioned, you know, so I'd, I'd like to, in some ways, go back to being, um, you know, it, it, just not having people die in an ICU with a bunch of tubes and lines coming in and out of their bodies alone. I mean, we saw this during COVID. It was so tragic. You know, so many people died alone in an ICU. And, you know, it was hard on everybody. Obviously, the the patients and their families, tragic. And but the healthcare providers, it was really hard to, you know, for that to be the end point for our patients, you know. And so, we're going to we're going to continue to fight this battle and i'm you know there have been enough people that it's been so exciting to see how many people are passionate about this and trying to make a difference that that i'm confident that we're going to break through i mean we've got a you know we've got a whole raft of baby boomers that you know could you know potentially choose a different path and i'm i'm hoping to get through to them to do so once you've been through this frustration you know, era, like even with my dad, they had signed the paperwork and, and, and I was in charge, but I also felt I still needed my family to get on board. How long would I have held out knowing me? Not really long because I knew my dad and my mom. I mean, we had these conversations. My brothers kind of chose not to be part of those conversations, but I, if for me, it was, I, I wanted them to feel comfortable because I didn't want them having regret. I didn't want to have that wedge. So it's, it's tough, but a lot of people don't even think to pull the paperwork out or, or they've had the conversation, but they don't know where the paperwork is, or it's never been given to the doctor. You know, I mean, there's, there's so many different levels. Let's talk about the advanced care planning and how does that, you know, work through you guys? You said, you know, you have, others that that utilize this other professionals but can an individual just you know go to your website and sign up to get stepped through this or do they need to go through your company or another company to process it no they can be uh, if you go to our website uh uh individuals can uh contact us and sign up to through their through our schedule tab to get their documents done and and we will walk through that process with them and uh, you know we will inc- will help them by it's all done remote by teams or zoom so they don't have to come to an office um, and we you know in, in most states um, we now have e-notary and e-signature so that uh, even that process of, of verifying the documents can be uh, can be uh, automated and remote uh, and then we are committed to so you know, one commitment is to get as many people as possible to do this. The second commitment is to make sure and ensure that the documents are available when they're needed. And so we give people um, uh, 
a, a, a QR code with a card, uh, you know, that they can launch their documents with the, that they can carry with them in their purse or their wallet. Uh, we uh, will work with the patients to to interface with their primary care providers to ensure that those documents are available to those primary care divide providers. And, and we also ensure that if the patient uh, as a, we have a process to ensure that a patient shows up in an emergency department that we can to try to facilitate by getting the documents to the treating providers under those emergent circumstances as well. Because it is true that, and you alluded to it, that getting the documents done are fine, but if they're at home in the safe or, you know, or with your, in the lawyer's office, then they're, they're not really helping anybody. So they do need to be available to the, fa- the family and the treating providers at the time when medical decisions are being made. And so that's a key part of our solution as well is to ensure that, that, that 24 hour availability and the people we work with, you know, so we, we interface with other doctors and, and other providers, uh, we that that do advanced care planning documents and they just use our they, they use our software as a service and so um, we have a number of partnerships with uh, death doulas where they use our our, our, our software as service and then we have a number of partnerships where we augment these the indigenous personnel to help try to drive completion rates in a larger patient population where, you know, if a healthcare system doesn't have enough providers to get all the documents done for their patient, their defined patient population, we have our own um, uh, facilitators, uh, advocates that will work with their patient population to complete the documents. And, uh, and, and again, it's, uh, there, we're at a, an inflection point from my perspective. I think that there is a lot more openness to this than there was even a few years ago. I think people see why it's important and 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 the many reasons why they benefit from doing it. And it, we're not quite there yet where, you know, there's been a, I, I think in some ways, it, 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 it in some ways it's a little bit analogous and maybe it's not the right analogy to draw, but it's a little bit analogous analogous to the conversation about cremation. You know, it wasn't that long ago where, you know, cremation was not viewed as mainstream, you know, and in a, in a relatively short period of time, it's kind of become the preferred method of, uh, you know, of dealing with the, with the dead body. And I think that um, I'm hoping that, once this momentum builds that we can kind of flip the switch on this, obviously more quickly than, than slowly, because it's, because I see it every day that where every day that goes by where this is not happening, more unnecessary pain and suffering and tragedy occurs uh, for our patients and their families. Well, you know, one thing too, with cremation, um, why I, I want it, is I don't want people looking at me in the casket going, does she look like herself? Or that's not how I remember her or her, her lips were different. Her cheeks are different. Or, you know, I don't, I don't want, that's not what death to me is about. It's, it's about my soul and my presence and how we touched one another, not how we look. It's not a keeping up with the Joneses type moment. That's, that's how I view it. And that's one of the reasons I want to be cremated. I don't want I I don't want people to have to go through that. I know for some people that's very very difficult. I'd rather be in the room, have my pictures, have people reminiscing about fun, you know, happy times and really celebrating, you know, our re- the relationships that we all have with one another instead of grieving and I know grief will be part of that process, but I I want there to be this upliftedness and I guess when my mom died we did we organized her own funeral and I had a lot of people there who had never met my mother I can't tell you how many people came up afterwards and said I feel like I know your mom I've never been to a funeral where I walked out and felt happy and thought I know this person even though I've never met them you know, and, and just reframe it in a different, in a different way. It doesn't have to be sad to the depths that I think so many people feel it, it, 
it is. It's kind of like that perception of the nursing home so many people have that it's dark and dingy and smells like urine. Well, that's not what they're like too much anymore. You know, they look very different than they did 40 years ago. And yet so many people are still holding on to that stigmatized image of what something's going to be like. And I think we have to, you know, as humans evolve and think about what can things be like? Because I think we can always do a better job. And again, I'm, I'm not here to try to convince people to get cremated. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not getting an affiliate fee or anything. I'm just using that as an example of how do you want to be remembered and what kinds of feelings do you want people to walk out the door with, you know, after they come? I think there's a lot of different ways to be able to to do that and have some control over that if you want. Yeah, and I think that I think that's for me where I'm at. And that is, I mean, well, I'm I'm also I'm gonna be cremated as well. But I think that my point is not that I I mean, people get to do whatever they want and you know, but it's their death and they should decide, you know, and then once they've decided, I think hopefully their family will accept their decisions and, and, and execute their decisions as they would have wished. And, and so the idea that you leave it to somebody else and make no decisions almost invariably is going to be going to lead to a situation where it really wouldn't have been done the way you wanted it to be done, you know, so take responsibility because it's your death and make your decisions and, you know, I mean, I'm with you. I, I kind of would like my death to be a celebration of my life more than if any, you know, if anything, that would be what I would prefer um, uh, and not have it be too dreary. Um, but, but it, but ultimately I just, I just respect the people who actually take some time and think about it and plan for it. And they get to make those plans and we will, we, you know, my commitment to them is fine. We'll honor it. It's your, it's your death. You get to decide what you want or don't want and, but make some decisions, please. You yeah. know, make, you know, think about it a little bit enough to give us some guidance as to what you would have wanted. Yeah. Cause that, that, that grief and that guilt can weigh heavily for years and years and years on people when they, when they haven't had those conversations I, I, with my folks, I, I remember my brothers going, well, I don't know what they want. You know, do they want to be cremated or don't they? And I'm like, well, I know because we had the conversation and, you know, one did and one didn't. And, and so that's what we did. But they, I mean, they, you could just see the panic within them because it was a question they never, ever thought of. And yep. they were, so, they were so afraid of getting it wrong. And you know, we can avoid that by just opening up the door to the conversation. And there's so many options out there nowadays in terms of, of, you know, how you want to live your life. I I remember when I was 40, I always thought I was going to die by the age of 40. And so I I seriously was planning that and uh, being prepared for that. And, and so I said, well, one of the things I want to do is, um, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a talker. I said, I want to have the last word. So I've written a letter to my audience to be read. And I'm like, I'm going to have to go back to that because I'm 64 and I haven't redone it. And who knows what's in it at this point. But that was my personality at the time, you know, to be light handed and to be able to express, oh, I'm going to get emotional, what they meant to me. Yeah. I, yeah, it can be, it can be, I think what you, it, it can be such a positive, it, it as positive as death can be, I, I think, I guess is the way I would phrase it. And that is that, you know, obviously it's a loss. It's a loss for your friends and family, for, you know, for when we're no longer there. But if we've, if we, you know, if we can figure out, you know, if it's our wishes that we would prefer to be, you know, dying outside of a hospital, surrounded by our friends, friends and family, and and if that's the way it happens, then that that's great, you know. And I would, you know, and if we if we can kind of define things enough so that our families don't fall into the trap of having a you know conflict over some of these discussions, then 
That's a very important thing from my perspective to avoid that because it's that can last, like you said, for years, you know, where and all of a sudden brothers and sisters who had previously functional relationships don't talk to each other. It's such a tragedy, you know, and it's certainly not what most of the patients, their their family members would have wanted. And so, you know, I think that it's just a matter of defining what you want. And 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 you'll what you'll see is that. It's more likely to happen the way you want it to happen, and it's much less likely to cause all sorts of secondary negative effects on both your family, but you know potentially uh, your friends and, and, and others. And so, and and uh, so it's the right thing to do, and we are excited about possibly being part of the solution. We think we have a very cost-effective solution. So we've been prideful about trying to get this out to as many people as possible and just make that difference and get people to start thinking about it. But, uh, you know, it's been a pleasure to be on your show and, and, and have the opportunity to talk about it and to express why it's so important. So I have a question for you. So, you know, you deal with the advanced care planning. Do do you refer people if they want to do like a lot of times people do their wills or trusts at that time too. They kind of, they kind of push it all off at one time, or are you just in the advanced care planning portion itself? We do have partnerships with the state and trust lawyers. So, I mean, and you know, those partnerships are where, you know, as you alluded to, it's a lot of times it's part, it's part of the, the, the will you know, process and the estate process. And so the, I think that um, we've made some progress with the estate and trust lawyers where they, they understand that their understanding of some of these concepts is less than what it needs to be in order to have the process be as dynamic and robust as it needs to be. And, and so they outsource that responsibility to us. And then we give them back the completed documents. They, they review them from a legal basis, but then that's incorporated into that conversation. Okay, wonderful. And are you comfortable sharing what price would be, or do you re- prefer that people go to the website and they? So the 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 price uh, for completing the advanced care planning documents, if uh, if you're just uh, if you're a uh, an individual who is com- is calling us to complete the advanced care planning documents. The process is the will schedule appointments with you and your medical surrogates that those appoint those zoom or team meetings, um, which uh, typically we're talking about uh, it, anywhere from two to four, uh, 45 minute sessions. Um, and uh, what, and then once the process is complete, we will save the data We'll, we'll give them the 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 documents them for their own personal pers- purposes. We'll interface with their primary care providers, and we'll ensure that the documents are available as much as possible, twenty four seven. And the fee structure for, currently for that is two hundred and fifty dollars. Oh, okay. Well, it you know that's a very reasonable when you're looking at you know really you know two to four hours plus pulling it together plus having the access and. And being able to ask questions, you know, to have that guidance through, because I know people go, I'll I'll just print out that form, you know, and then it's like, oh, what does that mean? You know, how do I, how do I answer that? Or, or they don't know that even the different examples of opportunities, you know, um, to be able to, to state their wishes and stuff, because, you know, we don't know what we don't know. And, And especially if we've been an ostrich with our head underground, and we've been avoiding even listening to the conversation of what should be included or different ways to look at things, um, then that can get scary too. And I, I've had a lot of um, friends and, and people that I've known through the industry that, you know, have said, well, you know, we're, we're just going to do that ourselves. It's a simple form. I've looked at it. And then, but then they sit down and go, well, I really have to think about this, <laughs> you know, but I don't even know what to think about with this question, I don't really know how detailed I should be or not be, or it, you know, is it legal or is it not? Yep, it's true. I mean, uh, the self-directed advanced care planning documents are out there. So, you know, but it is so hard if, if you don't have a medical background to really understand the questions and really understand 
what needs to be asked and answered as part of the process. So our the the advocates that we have, the vast majority of them are, are nurses, um, and we try to tailor the 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 past nursing experience. You know, there's subspecialty nurses that interface with the patients based on what their the med, the patient's pre existing medical conditions are. Um, for example, if they have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or end stage renal disease, we try to hook them up with nurses who are who have background in those areas, um, so that because they understand the territory and the and the kind of the scenarios that those patients are likely to face. And and right now that two hundred fifty dollars really just cover our costs for and most of the costs are the manpower for paying our nurses to to work with our with our patients. And so this is kind of an introductory pricing that you know, reflects our commitment to trying to make a difference in this space. And, and I think that the, we, they also, you know, we make the, I forgot to mention, but, you know, at the end of the process, we make the video and we ensure that we work with the, we make sure the video is incorporated into the documents as well. So it's a, it's very, it's been very rewarding. Um, we, we're just so excited to, to try to be part of this so, solution. Yeah, I'll give a plug for send off too. Um, and it sounds like you work with with them a little bit in terms yes. of celebrations of life. And yep. what, I mean, they've just opened the barn door on that on what that can look like, which is really fun, and very personalized. And, uh, you know, are just taking a very different approach, which is, which is really cool too on that. Um, anything that we haven't covered that we should cover? You know, I think we've covered most of it, again, if people have questions or questions for us, they can contact us through thanacare.com. Um, and, you know, we ensure that we will be back in contact with them and try to meet their needs. We'll, we'll make every effort. And, you know, I think that in terms of our dementia patient populations that you're so closely aligned with, again, um, I think that, this process, if we can get to the patients while they're still able to make some of those decisions in the earlier stages of the disease, I think it can be very helpful to their family members as they progress, you know. And so, I mean, it's not always possible, um, but, you know, a lot of people do have a, a period of time when they can kind of, they still can make some of those decisions. And I would just encourage them to 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 do so i think it'll be better for them and for their family members if they're able to to do that and again i understand it's always the same we don't necessarily want to think about it but there it 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 is the right it is the it's better for everybody if we do i oh i so agree and you know a lot of people with dementia are are becoming more proactive in this so um like you had said that you know, you have this little video that goes goes with the paperwork. Uh, many of them are doing videos on driving to try to take the guilt away if family members have to take the keys away if they don't feel that they're safe. And so they wanted to give them a message when they still have the cognitive abilities to communicate that and say, we don't want you to feel guilty. And we know that we might get mad and not understand why you're doing this, but this is our wish today. And so, you know, they are really more concerned and thinking more clearly about this because they know there's no, you know, there's no cure at this point. They know what this disease could look like. And so um, that's been really interesting to watch as well. The other thing that I would say is if you're dealing with this and you have someone who is chronically ill, don't just pigeonhole them to be doing this you need to be doing this too you know just like a lot of times we'll get a medical alert bracelet and it's for the person with the diagnosis well if you're caring for that person you should have one that says you're caring for this person so if something happens to you somebody knows there's someone else out there that needs care besides just you if you're getting hauled off in an ambulance because you had a heart attack they need to know who do we contact now to watch over so-and-so? Who do we pull in? And again, this is, I, I think that's one of the difficult things with these conversations is people think, well, it's, you know, I, I'm not dealing with that. So I don't need to deal with this today. That's not our choice when something is going to happen. 
And so we need to think ahead. Um, and again, not just for the person who has a chronic illness, because I think that that's the most natural play people go to. Well, we'll do it for them. You know, and I remember going through um, just getting my parents paperwork in order. My dad's like, oh, no, we don't need to do a will. We don't have that much. And we're fine. And you know what we want, Lori. You know what I mean? He was doing everything he could say to say, no, we don't need to do that. And I said, Dad, this isn't about end of life. This is about good living. This is about smart living. So Tom and I will do this with you. We'll go through and we'll do our wills. We'll do our health care directives because we believe strongly this is what we should all do probably when we're 18 years old and you know update those things routinely because we don't know when our time is up but that's not the general attitude i think you know out there people think okay i got a diagnosis and and then they're then they're scrambling i agree with you i, I couldn't agree more lori i mean that you can make a very strong argument that that it, it should be a you know, a requirement of all adults to to have this done because you don't know, like you alluded to some of the accidents that can take place. I mean, you know, we all, none of us is immune to the possibility of getting in a car accident where we're no longer able to make our own decisions. And, you know, I think that the likelihood obviously increases, um, the likelihood of our death increases clearly as we age, but it, it's it's not zero, you know, when we're younger. And, you know, and in, I think that there isn't a point in time when it's a waste of time to have done this. You know, it, 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 it there isn't. It, and so, yeah, it's, again, I appreciate you having me on and appreciate a, a shared passion for this topic. I really do. Thank you. Well, thank you. And to our listeners, you know, I always ask you to be a giver of hope. Like, click, and share. It doesn't cost you any money. It takes little time. But spread the word of this conversation because that might trigger others to have this conversation and reach out to Venicare and be able to go ahead and, and get things in order. It's just so critically important that we help one another out. And the more information we push out on this topic, the easier it's going to be for people to feel more comfortable with it. They're going to think it's more of a normal thing, which it should be. It just isn't quite yet. So again, you can go to um, their website at Thanacare. That's T-H-A-N-A-Care.com. They are on LinkedIn and also on Instagram. So you can go ahead and follow them that way as well. Again, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Madison, for being with us today and sharing your work. And um, I thank you for what you're doing. It, it really is a true need. And it's bottom line, it's a gift. And people don't always view it as such. And, and maybe this is something that you even want to gift a family. Maybe they're struggling and they can't afford the 250. You just have to start framing things differently. And I agree. We're, and again, we're doing everything we can. And I think that uh, it's, uh, again, it's it, it's been a pleasure to be with you today. And um, more than happy to come back, back anytime you want and have more conversation. But thank you so much, Lori. Well, thank you. Have a wonderful week, everyone. Bye now. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. It's time to rethink, renew, and reimagine retirement. Hey, everybody. Jared Sebesta here, host of Retire Repurposed. Now, this podcast is about the non-financial parts of retirement, which many times can be even more challenging than the financial. We believe retirement is not the end, rather the beginning of what could be the most impactful, purposeful, and fulfilling season of a person's life. So don't retire. Become repurposed. To listen now, search Retire Repurpose on your favorite podcast platform, Senior Resource, or Life Audio.